Actraiser was released in 1991 for the Super Nintendo by developer Quintet. They went on to make Illusion of Gaia and Terranigma. It was one of the first video games that I ever played when I was a kid. Our Super Nintendo was a fairly recent purchase and we only had one game, Super Mario World. My dad came home from work one day and casually handed me Actraiser. We weren't a wealthy family and games were usually a big purchase coupled with a big event like Christmas. I don't know why he chose to get the game, and I'm not able to ask him anymore either. Sometimes I wonder why he picked this one over others. Maybe someone helped him in the store. I don't know. Actraiser is equal parts action platformer and god game city builder. It was one of the first games released for the Super Nintendo, a time in video game history that is often colored by nostalgia and seen as a golden era. Although occasionally for good reasons, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, Mega Man X, A Link to the Past, Super Nintendo is some of the best games of all time a library of masterpieces. Unfortunately, Actraiser isn't one of them. The game is good, but it's by no means a classic. It falls just short of that honor. The game is split between sections of combat and managing your cities throughout the world. This is both the game's biggest strength and weakness. Neither half feels like it has enough depth to remain interesting after one playthrough. At least, that's my guess, because I was six years old the first time I played this game, and surprisingly, I still remember a lot about it. I can't relive that first playthrough again as an adult. Let's start at the beginning. Actraiser is a strange game in many ways. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. We see one of the worst ones right away. There's a lot of navigating menus, to the point that you might be initially confused about what kind of game you're about to play. If you read all of the options before trying one out, this already brings the game to a grinding halt. You can choose to fly around the world in your floating palace, or you can descend and begin the first level. From what your little angel buddy tells you, I believe that this will be what most people do. Even so, you get a view of the world when you begin your downward spiral to the planet. I think this is a cool transition, especially considering that it continues in the intro sequence to the 2D side-scrolling level with your god spirit or essence, uh, your god something falling into the world. Let's backtrack a bit. I should probably explain all the god things. Actraiser is more of a god game than most other god games, since you are role-playing a literal deity that needs to cleanse the world of evil and restore a population of worshippers. It's implied that this isn't the first time you've had to do this, and that some sort of cycle exists with god restoring the world and then slumbering, which is when evil re-emerges and the slow corruption of the world begins all over again. If we go back to the first platforming section, you can see that our spirit falls from the sky and lands into a statue that was already there on the ground. This is a minor story element, and I doubt that it really makes a whole lot of sense, but I think it's a cool touch anyway. The idea that these statues are remnants of previous people that worshipped you, that have now been lost to the evil free in the world. You're using a tool of your ancient subjects to purify this section of the planet. Unfortunately, when playing the game again for this video, I couldn't help but notice the resemblance it has to a crash test dummy, and now I can't unsee that whenever I play. The controls are standard, you can move left or right, you can jump, you have a sword, and you can attack with it. Later you get magic and can assign one spell to carry with you through a level. And that is it. That's all there is. There's no dash, no wall jumping or climbing, no charge attack, no sprinting, no Yoshi-like partner to jump on. There's only one power-up in the entire game and it's rarely seen, maybe only twice throughout the game's 12 levels. Movement feels slow, and without an option to run or to change how far you can jump, it feels like you're playing Super Mario World with a broken controller that's stuck in walk mode. Let's look a little more at that. If you jump while moving, you are half committed to that jump. I say half because you have the option to sort of stop yourself, but not change direction completely. This might seem like an intentional design decision to make you think more about when you should jump, but if you stop and then jump, you can gain that mid-air character control. Attacks are triggered instantly, but have short range. You can see the edge of your swings by the trail your sword leaves through the air. Adding to the overall sluggish feeling of movement, your crash test dummy is pretty big, especially compared to other platforming heroes of the time. Enemies are also large and take up a lot of screen real estate. I'm going to hazard a guess that making the game look impressive was put slightly above the game feeling better to control. I think they succeeded there. The backgrounds especially look great for a game that's 25 fucking years old. Anyway, getting back to attacks, simple combat isn't necessarily a bad thing if the game is built around it, but I don't think Actraiser is. Most enemies die in one hit, sometimes they have ranged attacks that you can destroy by attacking the projectile in the air, other times they can't be and it'll still hit you. Some enemies do look like they had some thought put into them and require the player to rush forward and then duck under their attacks in order to kill them, but for every one of them, there's another that spawns a projectile right in your face while you're attacking or will fly over you and drop another enemy that you need to dodge, 
with the game's slow movement. If you've just committed to a jump, the game can be very frustrating. In what I think is one of the strangest decisions in the game's design, it feels like the developers realized that frustration, and instead of tweaking the controls, decided to just inflate player health. Large portions of the game can simply be run through, and stopping to kill enemies is a choice because the invincibility grace period after being hit lasts long enough that you can keep on crashing through. There's only one area in the entire game that requires you to kill an enemy to unlock a door. It's on the second level, and after doing it, the game never needs you to do that again. This also continues in the boss fights, which always have a full health restore before you fight them, which also incentivizes running through a level. I think that some amount of care was initially put into these battles because they have attack patterns that you can learn and avoid, and most of them are actually pretty fair and challenging if you choose to fight them like that, but all of them are better fought by just standing close and spamming attacks while tanking their hits. Later on, when you acquire magic, it becomes even easier because you're immune while channeling the spell. This can pull double duty then, both in dealing high damage to the boss, and also making you able to stand still and avoid all attacks that are thrown at you. It's a shame because the more I play it, the more I think this really was intentional, and that all potential challenge the game could have provided the player was stripped in favor of a more accessible experience, one that's more in line with the city simulation sections. Clearly, a lot of care went into making these levels. They may not be much to look at now, you know what, fuck it, no, I, I still think they look pretty good. Maybe I'm being guilty of the very nostalgia I mentioned earlier, but I could see this game fitting right in with some of the indie platformers being released today. Actorizer might even look better than some of them. While on the topic of the game's presentation, I also want to praise the music. Uh, Dead Cat has more musical talent than I have, so I try not to comment on this sort of thing, but I still notice the Actorizer soundtrack and think it deserves a mention. This little jingle it plays after beating the game is uh, questionable. The levels are very short and assets are rarely reused in different areas, save a few enemies. It really is a shame that more care wasn't put into how you fight through them. The best example to show this quickly is the first zone in Ados. You are soaring beneath these rolling black clouds on a floating chariot dragged by two great white eagles. This is majestic as fuck and yet all you need to do to get through here is to stand still and spam your attack button. Other problems might be explained by conventions commonly found in games at the time. Levels have a time limit. Why? Because Super Mario World has one. Enemies also respawn if you turn around and go back. Both of these features heavily punish players who want to explore. There's a section in the second level that has spikes falling from the ceiling. You're meant to be able to see these ahead of time and plan accordingly, but they're positioned perfectly so the UI will block your view of them. There are other vertical problems like this in the game. You can jump up onto platforms, but not get back down again once you do. In a later level, flying enemies will appear right in your path of where you're meant to jump, or will throw projectiles in your path ahead of time making it so the best way to proceed is to take an unavoidable hit. You are encouraged again to run through because unless you're really confident, you can kill an enemy without taking any damage. You might as well just get hit once and then be on to the next area. It would be in poor taste not to mention the professional mode that unlocks after beating the game. This is a cheap band-aid solution to the combat in the base game and, like most cheap band-aids, it falls off halfway through. You are given limited lives and have to get through all of the levels in a row, it turns the game into contra. Enemy health has been thoughtlessly doubled. Some bosses you can still spam down, but there's a risk to dying now since lives are limited. I guess it's a little better, but now other problems the game has are emphasized. Uh, poor enemy placement, slow controls, and the lackluster player moveset. It's still a good inclusion, though. After clearing the first stage, you are whisked right off to the town building part of the game. I mentioned earlier that neither half of ActRaiser feels like it has enough depth. I want to clarify that I do not think that's because the game is split in two parts. I want to make really sure I'm not misunderstood about this. 
I do not think that the game suffers because development had to accommodate a design choice that essentially means it's two games in one. The simulation sections feel like their own game, and I mean that in a good way. They're not hamstrung by the platforming parts. I firmly believe that the building sections lack depth because that's what the developers wanted. It's just like the side-scrolling parts, fairly enjoyable and simple after you get the hang of it. ActRaiser was clearly made for children in mind, and as a child, I thought these town sections were the greatest thing ever. There's just enough complexity to make a casual first playthrough fun, and playing God by striking down lightning to clear bushes can be a cool moment for a kid. You can express change in the environment and then watch your town grow to fill those areas you cleared for it. Sadly, the game is marred by menus. Casting the spells that affect change on the world requires you to stop, thumb through a list to the spell tab, and then move over to the spell you want. Then there's a confirmation box. Then you need to fly your angel helper over to the area. Then you need to cast a spell, and although it looks cool the first few times, once you realize that your town's building progress is paused while this happens, it can make the process feel very slow. Double this if you try to cast the spell without having enough power to do so. You have to go through the game telling you what a horrible person you are for not waiting long enough. It's for this reason that increasing the game's tech speed is one of the best things you can do. I just mentioned waiting. There's a lot of it in this part of the game. As you can see, the area is quite small and split into square tiles that you need to encourage your town to build through. Another menu that also pauses progress allows you to select which tiles you would like your people to build on next. If there are houses next to the new tile, then a road is constructed. You then need to wait for new homes to be built on this new road before the road on the next tile can be built. This continues for the whole area. You need to wait for this to happen. You need to wait to acquire power to cast spells. You need to wait for the animations to play out. You need to wait for monsters to respawn. It was very surreal to notice this while replaying. The simulation parts of Actraiser resemble pay-to-win mobile games. There are monster layers in each area. The ones in this first section are fairly simple. Each time you kill one, you gain spell power and also send a soul to the town hall that can be used to create the people that go out and build the houses. I can almost see it. Pay 5 bucks for a starting pack of 100 souls. Pay 2 bucks for a spell power boost. Pay 10 bucks to make your lightning storm spell target 4 tiles at once instead of just one. But the game wasn't made by Hitler or Electronic Arts, so instead it's balanced fair enough that the waiting is okay. Mostly. The monsters will try to fuck with your townsfolk, so you need to defend them. Like the platforming sections, there's very little variety to this. You have your bow and arrows, and besides the odd special ability that doesn't really have much impact, that's all you have to do. The only nuance in gameplay here is that the wide monster sprites are far easier to hit if you attack them from above or below, rather than from the side. After guiding the roads toward monster lairs, your people can destroy it for good and gain all of those souls to make into more citizens. You can also kill all the monsters that each lair can spawn, but this limited number is so high that you'd be better off just continuing to live your life. With each lair that's destroyed, your town progresses to a new level of development. This is one of the charming things about the game. Your people start off in little huts, then they move on to wooden buildings, then there's a third tier that's unique to each country in the game. It's a neat visual progression that nicely complements the rest of the area changing. There are minor other differences that can happen too, an alternative crop field, or a lake changing color, or windmills instead of pastures, some levels unlock bridges to get to new parts of the map. This was riveting to me as a child. Maybe it still would be interesting if you've never played the game, I have no idea and no way to find out myself. I can definitely see it being compelling if you're new to games in general. The simplicity of it hits hard on subsequent playthroughs though. The ways that you can affect the map become obviously arbitrary and amount to the same thing. Select the right spell and then cast it in the right area. This wasn't a hardware limitation either, because Populous came out for the Super Nintendo before ActRaiser and allowed for greater freedom, albeit at the cost of how good it looked. Later levels still have you using lightning to clear areas, or rain to clear sand, or sun to melt snow, or dry up marshes. At the risk of repeating myself, this was incredible for a 6 year old me, but ended up immensely boring as I replayed it for this video. My goal became to guide the roads as quickly as I could to the most annoying monster's lair and then knock out the others after that. The difficulty suffers here. You cannot fail at building these towns. Your angel has a health bar, but hitting zero makes it so you can't attack anymore. There's no game over. You don't die, and you just have to wait some more, until the next wave of people rush out to build and grant you some of your health back as they do so. The way that monsters stop respawning after you destroy a lair means that building each country becomes easier as time goes on. Each town has two leaders that will talk to you incessantly, 
each time this happens, you're given a message. I know it's unexpected, but they want to talk to you. This becomes hilariously inaccurate after the 20th time gameplay is interrupted for them to talk at you. Sometimes they have requests, but these are inconsequential. Early on in the first level, a fire breaks out and you're asked to bring rain to stop it. If you fail, it doesn't matter. Some levels request different things that ultimately amount to the same thing. The most extreme of these is when you trigger an earthquake to connect two islands with a land bridge. With more enemies and challenges thrown at the player with perhaps a better menu system, these god spells could have been tied in with fighting the monsters and ramped up the challenge. However, I have to remind myself that this is going beyond what the developers wanted. It's meant to be this simple. It's meant to be like this. The roads you create are locked to a grid and then the houses are built for you, or even in spite of you later in the game when all the monsters are dead and you just let the game continue to run for the population cap to be reached. Leveling in the game is done like this, tied to the world's population. Leveling increases your avatar's health in the platforming sections. Magic spells are also discovered by completing tasks during town building. The most important of these upgrades are in the scrolls that your people can find. These permanently increase the amount of times you can use your spells, which can result in enough charges to spam them and wipe out a boss from full health to zero without ever taking damage. The worst offender of this is the island boss. I think this is the most mechanically demanding fight since you can't spam attacks on him while he's flying in the air. You either need to time your jumps or get him to drop a platform on you, which you can then use to counterattack. This boss is surprisingly difficult to beat this way, so it's much easier to save your spells through the level and then destroy him. As an aside here, I didn't choose this game on purpose for this part to be similar to Dark Souls, it just sort of worked out that way. Whoops. The game had a sequel which, disappointingly, removed the town building sections in favor of a traditional platforming experience. It's also a pretty terrible game in my opinion, but maybe I didn't give it enough of a chance. It's a real shame because, judging by the simplicity of the first game, it could have been a good introduction to expanded versions in a sequel. The statues that exist in the world could have been varied in each level to provide dynamic movesets. Past worshippers would have seen God in different ways and made different avatars. These could have been upgraded in each country, further strengthening the connection with the town building. Your cities could have interacted more. These are some of the best moments in the first game, where you take items and technology from one town and gift them to another, or that an offering from one area is needed to solve a problem across the world. You can connect the first two countries of the road, but the game never expands on this idea. Even if we forget about a sequel, I'm surprised this idea hasn't been done in a more recent game as it could be interesting. Today, the concept could be taken very far, with trade systems between countries and problems to solve on a worldwide scale. Cities could be larger and have more customization. More platforming levels could be present for the player to solve problems, or find items and upgrades that could then transfer to your angel helper and improve each town. Offerings could have been power-ups you could collect and then use before levels like in Mario 3. In a time when many games are starting to feel different only in graphics, smashing genres together could feel fresh. But ideas are cheap. They're easy to think of without facing the problems of implementing them. As the game is now, I still appreciate what they did. After beating the end boss, there's a tour through each area that reinforces the idea that the game was made for children. And to be clear, that's not an insult. A story and theme can be for children and the game can still be challenging. There's a brief recap of the events in each country. I think this was meant to show you what a difference you made in the world, but I don't think it was necessary. At the start of the game, you can move your sky palace around the planet and see the state of things before you get to work. Even if you don't do this, your fall into the first level makes seem the landscape unavoidable. Throughout the game, you constantly see how your towns now look from above. It's just like the game as a whole. It may look simple, yet it's charming. Actraiser is a great game that falls just short of becoming a classic.